Cliff, let's transition a little bit. You were uh, a minister. Mm -hmm. uh, you were serving uh, in the Little Rock area. Uh, Arkansas. Yeah, in Arkansas. Yes, right. Yeah, and, uh, and, and I'll try to avoid any jokes about Noah looked out of the ark and saw because of all the uh -huh, rain that's okay. going on out there. Uh, but you were, you were serving there, pastor of a church. Uh -huh. You were called on a lot to help other churches uh, in stewardship. Uh, tell us about that transition. How did you get into all of this? Well, it, it, uh, hopefully I got into it because uh, it's where the Lord wanted me to be in, in the first place. Um, in, in my ministry, I did a, a great deal of, of building, uh, relocated two congregations, uh, had uh, eight different capital campaigns and six building programs and a lot of those sorts of things. And, and frankly, it was in the midst of doing that that just uh, colleagues and others began to say, could you mind coming over meeting with my leadership? Would you sh would, could you go over with us how you did this and did that? And I was happy to do it. Um, uh, found out, you know, uh, how rewarding it was to me personally. Uh, started getting, uh, uh, going to more and more schools and getting education about just exactly how to do that. Till we're finally in, in 1992, uh, after a, uh, an extent in the, uh, in the Gulf War, I was over there with the 1st Armor Division, uh, serving as a chaplain and, and uh, I realized in doing that why, why Jesus frequently went to the desert uh, because there's nothing to do there uh, but to, uh, to ponder upon what God wants with your life. And coming back from that experience, uh, I said, you know, I need to step out of the pulpit and create this ministry of helping churches to do this right. So that's how Horizons got started back in 1992. And You've been doing this and doing a great job with it. Well, I appreciate it. We're, uh, we're either the largest or the second largest uh, firm in the nation now working with, with churches all over. Yeah. So it's been a great, a great blessing. Well, you and I had a chance to talk. I've read uh, your books. Um, and as we talked and prepared for this, we identified a number of topics that we thought would be important mm -hmm. for our congregational leaders to hear about and we identified those and then I sent out for those that registered early uh, a survey monkey and said okay here's the things that we're uh, interested in talking about and give us some input what would be important to you and you all responded and based on your responses we've kind of uh, cataloged these and we're going to go over them mm -hmm. uh, in something of that level but uh, really wanted to begin with this one uh, around competition yeah uh, you talk a lot about that and and when i heard you speak that was one of the first things that jumped out to me i had no idea what was going on uh, in, in terms of competition for the charitable dollars. Right. So tell us about that. Well, and, and I didn't either, Tom. Uh, coming out of ministry, it, it was an enormous revelation to me to simply spend a great deal of time with donors and, and just talking with these persons who belong to churches uh, and yet in many instances were making choices to give in other places in their church and without judging them. Uh, I started sitting down with them and saying, talk to me about this, explain this to me. And then uh, spending time with nonprofit executives and learning what they already knew that I as a pastor did not know, mm. which was an understanding of, of why people give and how they are competing with others for that, for that dollar. Uh, this quote that you've got on the screen is uh, a quote from Lyle Schaller, who probably over the last 50, 60 years has been America's greatest religious researcher, uh, so to speak, with the church. In one of his last books that Lyle wrote, he gave us this quote uh, that for over 90% of Christian congregations, we're not going to be able to compete because we don't even understand we are in competition. Uh, what I've come to understand is that as a church, we've done a fairly good job of communicating a message that giving is something you're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. Giving is good for the soul. A disciple gives, et cetera, et cetera. And we have preachers who preach that well. What our members are hearing is, yes, you're right. I do need to give, but I'm not going to give it to you. I'm going to give it elsewhere. 
and so they're making decisions right now uh, the latest numbers we got, Southern Baptist uh, church members give on average of 2% of their income to the church. Uh, but they're giving a greater amount than that. They're just choosing other places to give it. Uh, and uh, it is alarming uh, that, as we saw in here with incomes, how incomes have been, uh, have been flat over the last several years. Charitable giving has been flat except for the last two or three, and it has begun to rise again to where last year we had the largest amount given to charity that, that we have ever had. We finally got back to 2007 levels, but there has been a consistent and steady decline in those gifts going to religion. Mm. Americans are being far more discriminatory to what they're giving. And this is what, you've got this slide up here. So this is donations. This is t total donations. $335 billion was given to nonprofits. And you can see that it was back in 2007, uh, it, you know, we finally gotten above that, above that level uh, of giving. And, and that's great, however, what Americans uh, also in that same 2013 year, the lowest percentage of giving to religion has occurred. Okay, let me, uh, I think I can jump to there that. There you are. 31% of gifts go to religion. Uh, we're still America's favorite charity. The problem is, if you took this slide and you go back 30 years, the slide would do this in gifts to religion come straight down here. Well over 50% of all gifts used to go to religion. So America is saying, we're giving. We, we just gave more than we ever have. We're just not choosing you anymore. And, and this is troubling. Um, what I have found in the church is that we have not learned how to make the case why they should give to us. And that's the case we've got to learn how to make. Okay, so uh, they're giving, and uh, we've talked about the economy affecting some of it. Mm -hmm. And according to the uh, Giving USA report, some of the reason is they're not giving to the church because they're giving to um, uh, even Christian ministries but they're Christian ministries outside of the church. That's right. Uh, or uh, as they talk about the rise of the nuns, the unaffiliated, right. you know, more and more yes. people yes. Uh, are, have less and less to do with uh, the church. That's so right. there, there are multiple factors that are influencing this, but giving to the church is at the lowest level. Even though the dollars have gone up, the percentage has gone down. The percentage has gone down and, and in fact, Last year, in 2013 and in 2012, there was only one category of giving that declined. Everybody else showed an increase from the previous year. Religion is the only one that has shown a decrease. Well, I'm, I've got the 2014 Giving USA highlights, and one of the things it says is education went up, human services went up, gifts to foundations went up, health went up, environment and the animals went up, while giving to religion religion went down, went down. yeah and you know it, it's not just one factor but certainly it, it shows us that there is a competition for this dollar um, and I see it not just with statistics but but uh, uh, the other day uh, I'm working with the church uh, I was well aware that, uh, that uh, a family in that church had made a $300,000 gift to what was a $12 million capital campaign they were involved in. This family, whom I knew well, had, had pledged $300,000. Now, $300,000 is a pretty good pledge, you know. Most of y'all be happy with $300,000 pledge. Just checking. Well, about a week later, on the front page of the local paper was a picture of this same family shaking hands with the chancellor of the university who was thanking them for a six million dollar gift to the art department of the university. So I went over to see them. <laughs> I went that afternoon, I, call, I knew them and I called them and I said I want to come see you. 
and I went over and sat down and and was sitting there and and, and I said uh, called his, and his name was Jim I said Jim I said I I want to ask you about your distribution of these gifts because I know you have been a member of your church for over 40 years I know you care about your church I know you went to the university I know you care about that now I don't know how much money you've got <laughs> But I'm assuming you've got $6.3 million, at least. <laughs> and you looked at $6.3 million and you said to yourself, I need to divide this up. How, how will be the best way to do that? And you decided to take $6 million of it and you gave it to the art department of the university and $300,000. And I said, tell me what your thought process was. I think we're listening. Yeah. <laughs> He looked at me and he, he started to preach, really. He said, Cliff, you know how blessed I've been. He said, the Lord has, has truly blessed my life. He said, gave us a wonderful business that you know I sold about 15 years ago. And uh, we've done very, very well. He said, but at the age I am now, and Jim was in his upper 70s, or is in his upper 70s. He said, uh, I've got a responsibility to make sure that, that I use what God has given me in the best way I can to make this a better world. Mm -hmm. And he said, I am absolutely convinced that lives are going to be changed by what the art department at the university is doing. Now, he didn't say more than they'll be changed in my church, but he didn't have to. He had become convinced that lives were going to be better served at a public university art department mm. than the local church. And this wasn't some little country, we got three people in the pews church. He was in a church that runs a thousand on Sunday. Greater than that church is. That church had not convinced him that they were changing people's lives in a way that competed with what the art department was doing. And I have heard those kind of stories over and over and over and over again. And that's one of the ways we're not competing well. We, we haven't learned how to tell our story and how the gifts to us will benefit in comparison to how those stories are being told by our competition. And believe me, the university is your competition. The Boy Scouts are your competition. And Girl Scouts and United Way, those are all good things. You know, I don't want us to say competition is bad. That just because we're competing with somebody, we're good and they're evil. They're not. They're not. But they're, they are seeking the same dollars we are. And if you believe in your mission, you've got to learn how to communicate it in as strong and positive a way as they do if you're going to receive that dollar for your mission. Well, let's jump from okay. Lyle Schaller to Peter Drucker. Okay. Because Peter Drucker said something, and he did. Uh, I've just skipped way ahead in the presentation. Yes, that's fine. Uh, to, to this point. Uh, do you want to tell us about this quote and what well, Peter Drucker's and, point is? And Peter Drucker, many of you are familiar, Peter died here five, six years back, but he probably was America's greatest business guru for a number of decades. Uh, just a brilliant man. And he, he wrote a, a book called Managing the Nonprofit. And he gave us this quote that just really jumped out at me in regards to how people, I think, view all nonprofits, of which every Southern Baptist church is a nonprofit. And you need to learn to see yourself in that way. So that a business has discharged its tasks when the customer buys the product, pays for it, satisfied with it. Government's discharged its functions when the policies are effective. But the nonprofit institution, this is us, the church, we don't supply goods or services or controls. Our product in the pair of shoes or our regulation, our product is a changed human being. The nonprofit institutions are human change agents. Their products are cured patient, child that learns, young man or young woman, grown in self respect, a changed human life altogether. My point being, that's what we sell, that's our product. And that's what we have not been convincing America that we're doing a really good job of. And we have tried in many instances to compete on a playing field that frankly belongs to somebody else. We got a great recreation program. Let me tell you, the YMCA has a better one. 
And if that's what you're interested in, they're going to beat you every time. Well, we feed a lot of hungry people, and that's a really good thing. But there's four dozen organizations that feed people better than we do. Houston Food Bank. Yeah, you can you can just sure. name them by the dozens. If somebody said to me, uh, "Well, well, the, the, the church really, really involved in eradicating malaria. We're doing a great job." Of that. That's that's cr that's correct. Uh, the church is trying to raise some fifty million dollars to help eradicate malaria. Well, Marathon Oil Company just gave twice that amount of money. <laughs> they, they're better than we are. They had more resources. All we have to sell is that cross. That's what we have. That's what we advertise. We change lives in the name of Jesus. When you put the sign out there and you stick a cross on it, that's what you say. When people walk into your store and they see that's happening and they hear stories of how that's happening, they'll keep shopping at your store. And when they don't, they will go looking elsewhere where people are trying to compete for that dollar. And that's, frankly, that's the core of who we are. And in so many instances, we've gotten away from it, Tom. And, and that, is, that has hurt us. Mm -hmm. And w we've tried to, again, compete on someone else's playing field. And folks have said, you know, the, the, the church isn't that great at all that. Mm -hmm. But these people aren't making disciples for Jesus Christ. And, and, and that's where we have to focus. And when we get our focus back there, that's, where, that's when people will continue to shop and spend their money there. So I, I realize it's, it's talking about the church in business terms, and sometimes we're uncomfortable with that. But our product is a changed life. That's I, exactly I mean, we're, right. We're in the transformation that's business. That's exactly right. And it's, when you talk about that, then you're talking about not just what our product is, but why people would want to give. That's so right. let's let's move into okay. that because I know a lot of us uh, kind of get caught up in well, sure. should we use technology and those sorts of things? But the how we do it. That's right. It's not nearly as important as why. That's why, and and all the technology stuff. And Thomas can can run circles around me doing doing that kind of stuff. Uh, but it's the why. And they're the reasons that people give, and you've got them up there. There are three chief reasons why Americans choose to give. Three. Uh, all of whom nonprofits know extraordinarily well. Uh, really interesting happened to me about 10 years ago. I was speaking in Memphis. Uh, I had about 100 preachers were there. Uh, and in sort of an auditorium setting, it was kind of a, a, a elevated arena that I was talking in. and. Uh, I said, do, uh, do any of you have any idea why it is Americans even choose to give in the first place? And everybody was just, so I said, I think guilt helps. You know, taxes is the biggest motor. Had two or three things. Then this person stood up in the back and said, uh, well, there's three chief reasons. It's a belief in the mission, the re regard for staff, and a belief in fiscal responsibility. And I went, whoa. I said, You're, you are right. And I said, what's the name of your church? And uh, he said, well, I'm, I'm not a pastor. <laughs> uh, I'm the executive director of Habitat for Humanity. And I heard wow. you were speaking here. And I came by to hear what you had to say. Yeah. Not any of the hundred pastors knew, but the executive director of Habitat for Humanity knew why people give. Now, we need to understand it in the church as well, uh, because our communications are not based on why it is people give. The number one reason is a belief in your mission. Uh, they're going to give to that which they believe is effectively doing something they highly value. The people who give to save the whales have a high appreciation for saving whales, and they give to the organization that saves the most whales. You know, and you know, our job is to communicate, to tell our story. How are we doing that mission? And and I find that way too often our churches are are more silent. Or as one pastor said, "Well, aren't you supposed to keep a lot of this confidential?" You know, hmm. no, not if they give you permission. Um, but we gather our donors every seven days, every seven days, the envy of all nonprofits in the world. Do we every seven days have somebody, somebody sharing a story 
of how their life has been affected, changed, touched, moved, etc. What they have witnessed through the power of Christ and the church in their life that's made a difference. That is sharing that you're doing your mission and your donors are hearing it. <clears throat> on your website, when people click on it, is the, do they see a story of a changed life or do they see the smiling face of the preacher in the church building? You go on a nonprofit, they're going to have a story right up front as to how they're doing their mission because they know why. Your newsletters, do they have stories of how lives are being changed or do they have announcements about women's meetings and men's meetings and this and that, et cetera, et cetera. How are you communicating you're doing a mission they value and want to support? The second one is, is regard for staff leadership. Uh, if I told you the whole story of the six million versus the 300,000, you would have heard Jim's testimony of how his relationship with the chancellor of the university led to this gift. Mm -hmm. They had a, a long, close relationship, uh, and uh, uh, it was coming out of that uh, that the gift was made. The chancellor asked for it, Jim had the money, and he made it. He made it because he had trust in the chancellor to accomplish the mission he had expressed. People know that buildings don't change lives. Programs don't change lives. People change lives. And so every nonprofit requires of its leader that they be the top fundraiser for the organization. The president of every college is the top fundraiser. Now I know you work for a college and, and you're VP of development. But I bet your president is the guy that is looked at as the top one to close the deal, communicate the vision. Yeah, we're in the process of searching for a new president, and that's the number one uh, criteria. How about that? Number one criteria. Would, would you be surprised to hear that at Harvard? It's also the number one criteria. It's, also, it's the number one criteria of every college in America. It's the number one criteria for every Boy Scout executive or girl, whatever. They have to raise money. Because they love money? No, because they need money to do their mission. And, and, and that's what it's about. Okay, now this, this just church, really, yeah, this really strains us because you know, we want somebody that, that preaches or understands the church and we, we judge things by that. You're saying not necessarily that we have to change all of that, but we at least have to bring into the mix that the pastor is to be the lead fundraiser. Absolutely. You are the number one person who can affect the vision, the change, and the direction of that church more than any other single person can do. You can have the relationship that says, with your money, I can accomplish this that you value. No one else really in the church can say that as effectively as a pastor can say that. And we have tended in the church, and we're the only nonprofit in America, to say what we want to do is keep knowledge of the money over here because money's evil. We all read that in the Bible. <clears throat> Pastors we keep over here because we want to keep them pure and holy. And never the two shall, shall come together. Uh, I, I mean, we even say we don't even want our pastors to have a clue as to who is supporting the church. Right. Now I want to tell you, that's the dumbest thing we can do. Right. It doesn't help the kingdom. Okay, and that's the business we're in. It puts us at an incredible disadvantage to all of the other nonprofits and, and everybody. We can't have the relationships we need to have because we have these rules and, 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 and traditions that, that make it very, very difficult for us to have relationships. And a lot of that comes out of what I think is a, is a very poor theology of what money is in the, in the first place. You want to flesh that out for us a little bit? Well, we, we make money out to be some type of unique and, and special gift that's untouchable. For instance, uh, would uh, in our churches, if the preacher said to uh, the congregation, well, this afternoon I'm going to be attending a dinner uh, for the choir to thank all of these persons who give of their time to sing, uh, and, and to share that gift of, of music with the church. I'm, I'm going to have dinner with them to express my special thanks. How many folks in your congregations would say, Whoa, preacher, don't do that. You're singling people out. Nobody would, would they? And yet, if you said, this afternoon I'm going to be meeting with the 
top 12 donors to our church to thank them for the gifts that they have chosen to make that enable our church to be what it can be. How many folks would m greet you after worship is over and say, you shouldn't be treating these people special? Right. Mm -hmm. Now, why is it that we suddenly have said, music is a gift that, Pastor, you need to pay attention to and thank people for. Money is not. Now, you can go on down the line in a lot of different examples. Money is the only thing we've done that with. It's okay for you to have a special dinner with the people who work with your youth, special dinner with Sunday school teachers, special meeting for anybody who gives anything but money, and you're not supposed to know anything about that. It doesn't have anything to do with the kingdom of God. It has to do with sin. Hmm. Can I ask a question? I'm, I'm you so may. Sorry. Not that I disagree, I just want to flesh it out. It's okay. How does that balance with the temptation? Money is the thing that Jesus says, hey, don't show partiality to the rich man over the poor man. And oftentimes I think that's a little slope we find ourselves in. So what's a guard? Because I, I, I see where you're going. I, but what's the guard that you would say against that? Because, you know, I... I went to a fundraising thing one time. The guy says, I greet the guys that show up in a Mercedes. Someone else greets the guys that show up in a, in a, in a Volvo or a Bug or whatever. Right. So, so the Bible does point money out as, that we have to be extra careful about it. What would your insight be in talking okay. about Okay. In the Zacchaeus story, who was the richest guy in the crowd? Yeah, Zacchaeus. Who did Jesus choose to go spend the night with? Right. The richest guy. And it said all the people grumbled. Right, 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 right. Interesting thing in that story is Jesus says, I must go to your house. As if it's from a higher power that I, ha I need to spend time with you for whatever reason. Now, I don't know. Jesus also said he was more worried about the rich getting to heaven than he was the poor. Um, and yet, we will find that most pastors are more uncomfortable with the wealthy than they are with the poor. Um, so I think, yes, it, it, it's, uh, it's something we should be aware of. Money has its, its particular temptation for us. But other things do too. And our job as pastors is to frankly help people get over those temptations <laughs> uh, and, and, and to get through them to where they can be who God you know, wants them to be. Uh, the greatest sin in every one of your churches is not adultery. It's not alcoholism. It's not gambling. It's their love of material things. That's the greatest sin. And that's the reason, frankly, that most of our churches have these various barriers up. It's the same reason you go, don't get invited to a whole lot of New Year's Eve parties. <laughs> Preachers just don't, you know, we get invited to a birthday party, but we don't get invited to too many New Year's Eve parties. Why? Well, we don't want the <laughs> preachers to see what we're going to do on New Year's Eve. And it's kind of the thing, we don't want the preacher to know anything about money because that's frankly where my greatest sin is. And, but then that's why we ought to want to know because our job is to help them overcome that sin to get closer to Christ. So, welcome. You okay, touched can, on preacher correct. knowing. That, yeah. that, that is probably the area where you get some of the most, if not the oh, most, it is, pushback. It is the area I get the most pushback. Uh, there's, there's no question that I do. Uh, some from pastors, uh, mostly from churches, uh, uh, but you know, folks are, are coming around. What uh, I would say that one, back to this competition thing, we need to know what people give that we can have a chance to compete. Uh, I've had I don't know how many donors say to me, key donors, major donors, I don't know why the church doesn't value me. You know, I made several $10,000 gifts last year. Everybody thanked me, but nobody at the church did. Why did my preacher not care? Because your preacher didn't know. <laughs> so your preacher passed you in the grocery store, and he didn't thank you, but the Boy Scout executive thanked you, and, and, and the college thanked you. How quickly would you, if I send $10,000 to you, how quickly would I hear from you? Within 48 hours. Within 48 hours. Within 48 hours, he's thanking me, probably with more than just a simple form letter. It no, would he's be pointing my, to development from right. e ETBU. Yeah, he's yeah. a development officer there. He's so. not a pastor. Yeah. Was. What, what, would, what, would I, what would I get from the college? A handwritten note. Okay. Handwritten note of thanks. Dane, when you were a pastor, 
Would you have even known about the $10,000 gift and what would you have done? Uh, I wouldn't have known. Now, I want to put this discussion on a kingdom of God basis. How is your not knowing helping the kingdom? <laughs> That's I just how does it help that the pastor, the, ch the chief administrative officer of the church cannot say thank you to a degree that any of the 1.5 million nonprofits can simply say thank you. That doesn't make sense to me that it is helpful to the kingdom. The other uh, area that I think is absolutely vital is that in, in our church today we have to have leaders. We have to have leaders not just as pastors but in laity and we have to know everything we can about those who are going to be deacons or serve in high capacities within our church. That these are people whose lives can be looked at in an exemplary kind of way. This is what a disciple is supposed to be doing in the way they worship, in the way they serve, in the way they give, etc. In many instances it's the giving part we don't know anything about. And we have frequently in our churches set people up whose giving lives are very, very poor and we're giving them the keys to help give direction and guidance to the church. And what they do is lead people in a direction where they are. They don't lead them to a higher plane. Mm -hmm. So the key leader should certainly know, is this somebody who to the best of my ability is living a life of a disciple in all things that can be measured? And giving can be measured. It's one of those few measurements. I would say to you that how someone gives is probably the best spiritual indicator we have because money is what they value either more than God or next to God. And as they choose to part with that, Billy Graham said the closest thing to somebody's heart is their wallet. And I think, I think Billy got that right. Yes, sir. I have a question. I, uh, I totally agree with what you're saying. You are so smart. <laughs> <laughs> uh, several months ago, I asked the uh, director of our uh, finance ministry to give me a copy of all those who were paying the tithe. Uh -huh. And he said, OK, initially. But he came back a couple days afterwards and said, Pastor, I thought about that. but." I don't think it's a good idea because the people have confidence in me to keep their paying contribution uh, confidential. I kind of let it go, but it still bothers me because yeah. I, I look at it as you, where you look at right. it. Well, if you're willing to give your, your, your money to the kingdom, then you are willing to do the old board to do things for the kingdom. We see what they've done. How do you, how do you rebut that? You, well, you have two choices as a leader and pastor of this church. You can either know what people give or you can guess. Every pastor I, who doesn't know guesses. We all guess. You know, we're asking so-and-so to be a deacon. You know, I, you know, I do see him in worship, and, I, and I'm guessing. I'm guessing that they're good, you know, because if you knew they weren't, you probably wouldn't be asking. But, so you guess. We guess. And, and I want to offer to you, I see you, and I'll get you. I want to offer to you that in no place that I've ever seen is guessing a better style of leadership than knowing. <laughs> I mean, it just didn't. You, you, you don't want me to come up. What's your name, sir? Doug. Doug. If I'm Doug's doctor, you know, and I come up here, and Doug's in here for his annual physical because he's smart. He wants to take care of his physical body. And I'm his doctor, and I stand there, and I look, you know. i tell you what, Doug. Let's... Uh, I'm going to put you on blood pressure medicine and I want to get you a statin drug for your high cholesterol. And you're a pastor? Yes, sir. All right, we're going to put you on some uh, uh, anxiety drugs <laughs> as, as well. All right? Okay. Now, Doug, I'll see you next year. How do you feel about your physical? Not very good. <laughs> Doug is probably wondering, you could know what my blood pressure was. How come you didn't take it? You, you could know what my cholesterol is. You didn't even draw any blood. But my answer back to Doug is, I've been a doctor for a long time, Doug. And a guy about your age, you know, I, you probably, ha you know, I kind of know what you got. You're still not happy that I guessed, are you? Why would we be happy that we put our spiritual doctors in a position of guessing about our spiritual health? Is the spirit less valued 
than the body is? You see, as pastors, we're kind of the spiritual doctors. And, and what we've done wrong in so many instances, we have guessed, well, I think so and so is really living a fruitful life. What we don't know is they're giving $500 a year to the church. We don't know that. And we're saying to them, you know, God bless you for who you are in the church. We're telling someone whose soul is sick, you're okay. And that's not good for them. And it's not good for the kingdom. It's not good for the church. And so I would never say, okay, you, you know, so you take this money and, and, and that means, you know, you can go focus on your top five folks and you stroke them all the time and da, 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 da. No, we have to use pastoral discretion and understanding as to who they are. Uh, but it is information we can have to put into the mix that we can help give a spiritual diagnosis. Amen. And I think it's, it's vital. I've probably talked too long about that, but it's vital. I, and, and I'll say one other thing to you really quick. Uh, I, I hear a lot of churches when I go in and we do research on them, Don or Richard or Thomas and I do it. And, and we'll see, they don't let the pastor see what people give. And I'll say to them, why do you have this? It's not a rule, frankly. I've never, I've, in 22 years, I haven't found it written down anywhere. No. It's, a, it's, a, it's a tradition. But they'll say, well, we've never done that. No pastors ever. Why? We want to make sure our pastor treats everyone equally. Have, have you all ever heard that? Yeah. Yeah. Let me just say to you, if you treat your members equally in the church, you should be fired tomorrow. Because they ain't equal. <laughs> They're not equal. You know? And your job as a pastor, and you know that, you know that is to take them wherever they are on their spiritual journey. To love them and help them grow towards that cross to be like Christ. And knowing how, how they give, knowing how they worship, knowing how they serve, knowing how they come to Bible studies, etc. is all a part of that mix where you're judging how you need to treat them to have them as spiritually healthy as possible. And you're not knowing makes no sense to me. Okay. I'll Why don't we just stop right there? Because okay. I think, for one thing, uh, you've really caught their uh, their heart and their attention, when, especially when you say we shouldn't treat everybody equally. Uh, so we're, we're just going to take a, about a 10-minute break. Okay. And then we'll come back. Sounds I'm going to watch that. I want to give you as much time as possible because I think these folks want to hear what you have to say. Well. Cliff. First, I'll tell you again, thank you for being here. I know it was a challenge to get here. I think you have stirred our attention with some of your comments. And, and you, you really are challenging us to think differently about the whole concept of stewardship, moving from whatever thinking as a pastor is to thinking more as a nonprofit organization. And you've said to us that nonprofit organizations, they know uh, about giving, about fundraising, and as pastors, we typically haven't. You've em emphasized the importance of keeping the mission in front of the people, that our mission is transformed lives. Uh, you've talked about the pastor knowing, mm -hmm. and that's, that's been something you've received some pushback on and questions about even during the break. So why don't you kind of pick up there? Okay. Uh, and, and we can kind of close this out a little bit. Uh, it was the last thing we were talking about was also the, uh, uh, the primary thing folks who stopped and, and stopped to talk to me about and I think probably as far as Richard or Don uh, to talking to them about it too. Uh, and part of that is that most of our churches, uh, in most of the Protestant churches in America, the pastor does not know. 73% of the churches uh, pastor doesn't know the donors, so it's a it, only a minority of the time does that occur. Uh, I shared with you a little why I think that's a serious mistake and puts us at a great disadvantage. I'm also well aware that for some of you who may have said, "Boy, I really agree with you," but we're, we're my church isn't there yet. <laughs> what do I do? Uh, what I have heard in feedback. Uh, in response uh, that's been very helpful to pastors around the country in trying to get this changed and some other things that we'll be talking about today changed in their stewardship life 
is that they have had their core leadership, whoever that is, maybe your deacons or some church, maybe another, another group for you, the core leadership to all read uh, uh, one of, I, I have five books out there, but one of two books. Uh, not your parents' offering plate, which I think you have, you have up there, or rich church, poor church. Which Both, I left at home. That's right. Both of those books deal extensively with this issue of knowing, as well as with a lot of other things. But they make the case prior to uh, uh, saying this is the way it should go, which helps you channel the conversation. Now, what these pastors are saying to me that they did is they purchased a book for every one of their leadership folks, and they gave them the book and said, I want you to read this. I want us to discuss it over the next month or whatever. We'll take the first two chapters and the third and fourth, et cetera, et cetera. And, and let's see what it may have to say that we can learn something about in our church. That lets the book be the driver of the change, and it lets you simply be a participant in the discussion. So instead of you saying, well, I went to this meeting at the association office and this guy from Arkansas said, so we ought to change this. Yeah, You take, you take the book and, and with, without you taking a position, you just become a part of the discussion. Well, you know, it, it says if we don't know, we get. Why would we think, you know, let's talk about this. The book oftentimes sells them on the need for this change as well as others. You know, I share that uh, uh, somewhat hesitantly because I'm obviously saying go buy a dozen copies of my book which I really hate to go to seminars when that's what the guy does all the time is say buy the book but that is frankly what is coming back to me that works don't ask them to buy the book don't buy one book and say we're gonna pass it around if you buy it and give it to them they feel obliged to read it because you did that you can get it for about ten bucks, and uh, but it may it may help you. It may be an avenue for you to to go down. The last thing I'll say is don't let anybody sell you on in our church. Giving is between the giver and God. You've all heard that, right? In our church, giving is just between the giver and God. That is not true. <laughs> it is not true. In your town. There are a huge number of CPAs who know exactly what that person gave to the church because they declared it on their taxes. In your town, there are banks on every corner who know exactly what that person gave to the church because it's on their tax return. When they went to get a loan, they had to take the tax return. Uh, you know, when, when that information goes to that bank, the loan officer knows it, the loan officer's secretary knows it, and the, and the board of that bank knows it. Uh, there are, in reality, in most communities, a dozen or so people who actually know what someone gives to the church. Why shouldn't the person who's actually in charge of running the church know it too? Let me know. So this thing about, I always love it, somebody says, in our church, no, -uh, it's between the giver and God. And I usually say, well, who counts it? Right. <laughs> You know, well, Aunt Hattie counts it, and she's counted the money here for 87 years. Well, Aunt Hattie knows, and that just blew the theory by 50%. It's, it's God, the giver, and Aunt Hattie. So, you know, uh, so that, you know, we love that phrase. A lot of churches use it, but in reality, they know that the accountant can't do the accountant's business, bank can't do the bank's business. Why, why would we think the church's business is any less valued? And it's better for us to guess on something that we could know. We, we should. Okay. I've, I've beat that a long time. So All right. Let's and go to wherever you want to go. You've done a good job with it. All right. <laughs> uh, let's go back. Uh, competition in charitable giving. We, we did talk yeah. about that. And you talked about the difference between nonprofit thinking and the way we think as the right. church. One of the things you didn't bring out was that there's almost double the number of nonprofits than there was, say, in 1997, 98. There are. Uh, nonprofits are growing at a rate of about uh, 5 to 7 percent a year in the United States. The number of churches has remained at about 340,000 for the last 20 years. 
it hasn't grown at all. We've planted a lot of churches, but also killed a lot of churches. <laughs> Same numbers. Not a county in America, by the way, today, that has more churches in it than we had in 1974. That's really not what I'm talking about, but I just love that statistic. It's, it's, it's not one to be proud of. But what we have seen as charitable giving has remained somewhat flat until the last couple of, since 2000, charitable giving has roughly been flat. The number of nonprofits has steadily been on the rise. So what you have in your community is that as there has been the same amount of money to be handed out, there have been more folks at the table trying to get it. You know, you, you started out, you know, you had four chicken legs at the table, and you had four people at the table. There's still four chicken legs, but now there's six people at the table. Somebody ain't getting the chicken leg. And the one who has not gotten the chicken leg in the last 20 years has been the church. That's who's, that's who's missed out. We've, we've, we've totally missed it, um, how competition has changed it. It's, uh, it's kind of similar to the town I went to college in. Uh, when I was uh, in this town, there was one place to buy a burger. One place, Brannon's Drive-In was the only place to buy a burger. And they used to advertise in our little college paper you know, if you want a burger, come to Brandon's. Get a burger at Brandon's. That was their thing. Get a burger at Brandon's. And, you know, if we were going to really impress our date on Friday, we'd take her to Brandon's, you know, get a burger. Well, my son subsequently grew up and went to that college as well. And when he got there, there was a McDonald's and there was a Wendy's and there was a Burger King and there was a Sonic and you just name them and they were everywhere. There was one burger place that was not there and it was Brannon's. Brannon's never figured out how to compete when the environment changed. And to some extent, that's where we've been as a church. Mm -hmm. we, we have said for so long, well, you give because we're the church, and your grandma did, and your daddy did, and so you should because we're the church. And, and our biggest reason to motivate them, to even they, well, why should I give money to you, preacher? Well, because we don't have any. <laughs> and that used to work. That used to work. Because if you wanted a sense of doing good or giving to somebody, the church was kind of the only place around to sort of do it. And it was tradition. It was obligation. People responded to that. But not anymore. It's a new generation. Okay, so... A lot of our appeals are we're not making the budget. Yes. Uh, we need to have a catch-up Sunday, so let's pass out catch-up to everybody to remind them we need to catch up on uh. their giving and <laughs> we need to, yeah. you know, catch up on the budget. You're saying those kinds of appeals are becoming increasingly less and less effective. Absolutely. And that instead we ought to be focusing on what the mission of the church is. I, I think you identified three things: uh, the mission and the uh, uh, confidence staff the leadership staff. and fiscal responsibility. You didn't talk a lot about fiscal responsibility. I, I, I did not, and, and, and thank you for bringing that up. Uh, the third chief reason why people give is they want to give where their money is going to be well used. They want to have a sense that I'm going to get a return on the investment. And in the church, the return they want is I want to see lives being changed. I want to see money effectively used that lives are changed. Now, all nonprofits, again, are well aware of these three reasons. And that is why they never share their dirty laundry with their donors. When they have financial issues, the last thing they do is throw a letter out to their donor base saying, we're sinking, Salvation Army's going under next month if you don't flood the kettles right away. They understand that decreases giving. It does not increase giving. So they just keep talking about how we're doing the mission. We're doing the mission. We want to do the mission better, et cetera. The church is the only nonprofit that seems to believe the more we cry wolf, the more people will respond to us. We're the ones who, when we finish up our finance meetings at the church, people say, Preacher, you get up Sunday and you just tell them how bad it really is. You know? And 
you know, here we are in Houston, you tell them no air conditioning next week if you don't give better, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And if you, if you just tell them how bad it is, they'll just take their wallets out and just hurl them up there on the chancel. Well, that's not true. America responds less and less to that. And it has to do with competition. They're getting communication every week from someone wanting gifts. Every week. You're the only one who tells them we're almost broke. And they're beginning to wonder, is money being used well up there? I never get a we're about broke from the college. I never get a we're about broke from the soup kitchen. I never. I think maybe I need, to, I need to start moving a little money from First Baptist over here. Because I'm just not sure. that We believe somehow that if we communicate fiscal irresponsibility, even when it's not so, that that'll help giving go up. We'll get calls at Horizons, first of the year, January, February. People will call us. We got a problem. What is it? We're running a surplus. You got what? We have more money than we planned on. What's the problem? We don't want anybody to know. <laughs> They're so used to believing we've got to tell them we're broke for them to give that when we're doing well, we want to keep it a secret and make them think we're sick. We'll say stuff to our members like, we're halfway through the year. And we only have 42% of our budget in. So, what's the biggest giving month of the year? December. December. Did you expect to have 50% in in June? <laughs> no. But you just told your people you did. Oh yeah, because when they think we're behind, they give more. We, 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 lie, we even lie about it. To make them think that we're, that we're not fiscally responsible. Those things need to be examined, you know, in all our churches, you know. What, what is the message we're sending? And um, the we need money now just isn't going to cut it. Well, I know there are a lot of questions around the three pockets of giving, and I want us to get there. Okay. But if I can, let me shape things just a little bit, because this kind of leads into the question of how do we make the ask? Oh, okay. And I know... Uh, one of the stories I remember you telling was that we don't ask. Yes. Uh, so I want you to tell that story uh, uh, about, you know, the... the but I, I also okay. then want to move to the, the budgeting process because that is a way of making the ask. It is. Uh, and, and understand, you know, when, when he's talking about the ask, and in fundraising circles, that's always a capital A, you know. Uh, you know, asking someone for money. The church does that the poorest of all nonprofits. Mm. Uh, other nonprofits have become very adept in understanding that there is an expectancy on behalf of a lot of donors that they'll actually be asked for their gift. They're, they're, they, they'll not just be expected to come up with it on their own. And they view it almost as they're honoring me by asking. You know, they're, they're respecting me. They're, they're not just assuming I'm going to do this. They're actually coming and presenting their case and putting themselves in front of me and asking for that gift. And, and the donors are viewing this in, in an honorable sort of way, not, not in a, a mooching kind of way as, 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 as we would look at it. But the church does that very, very poorly. Uh, number one, uh, we don't oftentimes know who to ask. And we even think that if we think about it, that we're somehow dancing with the devil. Um, and that, again, is a theological issue between us and money. But let me tell you quite simply, when I'm making an ask to somebody about a project, frankly, how easy it is to do. Uh, and, and this would be an ask, Tom, for something specific. If you're in a capital campaign, maybe, or building effort, or maybe you're starting a new mission and, and having a, a particular appeal. An ask to me for someone to share their gift of wealth is no different than an evangelism call to me. 
It's no different. If I'm, if I'm making an evangelism call, if I'm going to share with someone why I believe that they should have Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, I really don't go up to them. Now, this is me. But I wouldn't go up to Richard and say, Richard, you need Jesus. I know it, and you need it right now. That's what you ought to do. I wouldn't do that. I would share with Richard what Jesus Christ has meant to my life. I would share with Richard how I could not live one single second without knowledge of Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And the difference that it's made in my life and the strength that I've gotten and the sense of, 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 of grace and, and, and forgiveness and new life and eternal hope and all these things are there with me every walk of every day. And, and I thank God for that. And I would offer to Richard what it has meant to me and would say, you know, Richard, if, if that's not something you know, I would invite you to explore that because it has, that relationship with Jesus has meant so much to me. Okay. I, I wouldn't presume to know what's in his heart. I would share what's in mine and invite him to share in that. When I'm doing a call to someone to, for a gift, it's the same thing. I am sharing with them my passion for what we are about, how I believe in it wholeheartedly, why I'm so supportive of it, and how I would love to have them be a part of that and to share in it. And then I would invite them in very specific terms uh, to take what God has given them and to invest in this which I believe has been so worthwhile to me and will mean so much to the kingdom. And I simply give them that opportunity to say yes or no. I don't tell them they should give. I don't know if they should. I share with them why I am, why I believe in it. You know, I, I would look at Richard and, you know, and, and I might say as we're sitting there, you know, Richard, this youth building that we're trying to build, I'm telling you the difference I think it's going to make in our church is, is, is absolutely incredible. You know, with the high school right down the street, we have dozens upon dozens of kids every day walk right past our church. If we could set this youth center up and have it here as a place these kids could come to, a safe place, a place where we can witness to them that, that they can feel loved and, and cared about, that we can have a counselor on site right here. Yeah, they can play games and they can this and that, but we're here to love them. I, I can't imagine the difference that it might make in our church, the difference in the lives of these kids, a generation that we're about to lose, and we could have them. And we could save them right here at First Baptist. That, that's why I'm so excited about this. But I can't pull this off without someone being willing to step up and to help lead this, to, to raise the belief level of the rest of our church that we can pull this off. And I wanted to know if you'd consider a gift of a half million dollars to get this started. That's what I'd say to him. Now, I didn't tell him he had to. Didn't tell him he should. I told him why I believe in it, and then I invited him to participate specifically, and I let him. Now, okay. if we're focused on a particular project, right. that would be the approach. Yes. But every year, we do something called a budgeting process where we're making an ask, but the ask that you know. we're making is pay the utility bills. Right. You, Give us 3% more than last yeah, year. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you talk in one of your books, uh, Not mm -hmm. Your Parents' Offering Plate, about using a missional budget instead of a line item, a line budget. item budget. And when I read that last year, uh, that was the first time I had really okay. uh, come across that concept. We even began to change the way we made the ask here and the way we presented our budget. Okay. So I want you to talk about that and, and okay. explain the difference because sure. I think one of the things I, I gleaned from you is a very practical approach That's to right. all of this. And This is not hard. And yet I made the mistake as a pastor year after year. One, I believe what I need to be is transparent. Don't you want to be transparent in the church with where the money goes, so you send everybody a budget, right? Don't do that anymore. <laughs> it's not a good idea. This is a line item budget. It's just a, 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 a piece of one that is up here. But you see what we've got here, and, and you all create something like this in your churches, don't you? Of, of sorts. And so I can look on here, and I can see the utilities are 8000 bucks, and we're spending 5000 for maintenance. And... Da, 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 and then we've got these different programs. What's not on here, there aren't any salaries. That, that, that didn't make the, 
the, the, the slide, but usually we have a personnel item and we have the salaries and, and that kind of stuff. What most church budgets are going to look like, they're going to look like you are paying for nothing but people and buildings. That's what it's going to look like. Because if we had salaries up here, that amount would equal about 50 to 55 percent of that overall budget. That's, that's what staffing is in a church. It's, it's a little over half of a budget. And then we would look and we'd see that, golly, the buildings, expenses, that's another 35. My gosh, we're 70 percent of this whole budget is buildings and, and people. Now, I am Bubba Donor, okay? And you just sent me, uh, Bubba Pew Sitter, if you will, this budget with a letter saying it's that season again and we want, want you to be committed to the budget for next year. And I'm sitting there saying, I'll be darned. We're paying the preacher $50,000 a year. And what in the world does he do? Fifty And the secretary, dang. Well, she's making 24. She didn't answer the phone last Tuesday when I called up there. And here we got utility. Yeah, $8,000. <laughs> That's why that light was on at 2 in the morning the other day when I drove by the church and saw it. They turned the lights off in the place. They wouldn't have. I'm just, I'm sitting here getting really frustrated that you're not doing anything with my money. I want you to know, Cliff, I pastored in Arkansas. This sounds so real. <laughs> You want me to talk about Texas? <laughs> <laughs> I can talk about Texas. I know you can, too. Uh, oh, I tell you, I do want you all to know, we, we, uh, uh, when I was a pastor and I had all these campaigns, we always had to hire somebody out of Texas to come to Arkansas and my church to help us with our campaigns because all the major national firms were located in Dallas and Fort Worth that were doing capital campaigns. So we'd bring them to our, and that frustrated my people. Why do we got to get some guy to Texas? Come up here, tell us what to do. And I said, well, because we don't know how, you know. And they didn't like it. Okay, back well, to Bubba. I got you sidetracked. But the, the biggest state, I'm, I'm going back. But the, the, <laughs> the state where Horizons does more business now than any state in the union is the state of Texas. And it thrills me to come down to a church in Texas and say, folks, you can relax now. I'm from Arkansas, and I'm here to help you. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Feels good, doesn't it, Richard? Yes, it does. That's right. <laughs> okay, okay, so, so you're telling me so, there's no so, inspiration in no, how much we pay for utilities. It tells me nothing. You see, it, that tells me nothing. The number one reason why people give, do you remember what it was? A belief in the mission. What does this tell you about the mission? Nothing. There is a word that says missions, $500, but okay, so looks like we're doing nothing. Now, put the mission budget up there, Tom, if you would. This is the same budget. Our plan of ministry to provide meaningful, life-changing worship every week of the year. Okay, Bubba likes this. My church should be doing worship. Last year, we held 112 worship services. Dang, I had no idea. 190 people gathered, praise God. And here's 14 persons gave their life to Christ. Well, that's what we're supposed to be doing. And nine rededicated themselves. A special music event on Easter, Christmas Eve, had over 100 people. You know, that Christmas Eve service was really good. It was. The young man joined the church after one of those, was baptized. He said that's only the second time he'd been in church in his life. Next year, we're adding a junior choir. We're planning on them singing on Palm Sunday. A new praise team's being trained. A second service is planned in September. We want to increase. Lord have mercy they do all that for $80,000. Gosh, I'm getting a lot of bang for my buck. Now, how did I get to $80,000? I took the percent of the pastor's time that, that he spends to prepare for worship. If we're paying him $50,000 a year, Pastor, how much of your week doing sermon and worship planning? Gosh, 40% of my week's put into doing that. 40% of the salary is placed under worship. 40% of pastor's utilities, expenses, insurance. Secretary, secretary, how much of your time is spent to get us ready for worship? About 20% of my week's on doing the bulldozer. 20% of that salary. Janitor. See, people like a clean sanctuary versus a dirty one. 
janitor, how much of your time is doing the same? Well, that's a whole day. All right, one-fifth of that salary. It's worship. Utility bill. People like the lights on. They like air conditioning. So we kind of guesstimated what's that. But you put it under worship, not just in a line item. And then you go down and under nurture and under witness. The things that you are doing in your mission you take that line item budget and divide it into those categories and that's what you mail out. You follow me? That's a very honest communique. That's exactly what every nonprofit does. It's exactly what they do. They tell you what they're spending. You know, I know that the CEO of the hospital is making a huge six-figure salary, but I don't really care about that. I want to know, are they healing people? <laughs> making sick people well. I understand you got to have a boss and going to have a side, but they're telling me the money they spend to do their healing arts. You're sharing the money you spend to do the things people want you to do, like worship and education and mission, et cetera. That's how you divide it. Now, you print a line item budget. You need one for your finance people. You've got to have that to run your business. And you say when you mail this out, like we've got on the bottom, a line item budget is available for anybody who wants to review it. So if you got somebody, preacher, you're hiding something from us. No, you can see it. But you don't just hand it out. Do you know how many people in your church really want to look at a line item budget? <laughs> you know, it's like two. And they're up to no good. <laughs> you know that. So that, that's, that's how you do it, and it will make a huge, huge difference for you in just how you are communicating with your people. All right. Go. Now, you, you talked about that, and we're making the appeal. Mm -hmm. Generally, when we're trying to get the budget met or other things, we're only focusing on one pocket that a giver has. Yes. So I want you to talk about the three pockets of giving. Okay. Every member in your church has three pockets they can give from. Generally, we only focus on one pocket. That's the annual pocket. There's, there we go, the annual income pocket. Now, that's what goes in here. I make this much money, I stuck it in here, and the church said, please give us a percent of this. And we pass the plate around on Sunday for that to happen. We, we do that fairly well. Then there's the capital income pocket. Now, capital income are stocks, bonds, properties, uh, inheritances, they're accumulated wealth assets that we have that have come into our life. We are as accountable for those unto God as we are anything else, but we're not using that to buy groceries and pay the rent and, and that sort of stuff. We take that money and we sort of stick it up here, okay? When, you know, we either stuck it for a purpose and maybe we didn't use it or that's up there for someday when I may want it, but it's just sitting in this pocket, but I don't use it every week. Then there is the planned giving pocket, the estate pocket, that everybody has at the point in time that they die. And we are horrible with this. Horrible. And we've got to improve on our requests to people to remember their church in their will. It's very, very important. We are still America's favorite charity. I mean, we get 31 cents out of every charitable dollar. The next highest is education. I think it's 16%. Mm -hmm. We're America's favorite. But when it comes to planned gifts, bequests, etc., we rank fifth. Fifth. We only get 8 cents instead of 31 cents. Now, why do you think America's favorite charity would rank fifth when it comes to estate giving when you think if we're the favorite, we ought to be first? Why? We don't ask. That's exactly it. We don't even get in line. We are not even in line. And people do not think about us. You know, I can't tell you how many pastors when we've gone in and worked, I, I know Richard, Don, Thomas have had this, when we've gone in and said, oh man, I cannot believe it, you know. Old Uncle Harry died. That guy had been in this church for like nine decades. And we all knew, gosh, that guy was Richard and dirt. And we knew when he died, he was going to leave us something. 
We didn't get a dime. What did, did you ever ask Uncle Harry? <clears throat> well, no, we never talked to him. Well, my guess is whoever did is who wound up getting the dime. You know, we have failed. Yes, sir? I'm David Strong from First Baptist College of Nation. We have a church member that passed away last year and left us a fourth of his, uh, three fourths of his estate. Great. Uh, and it's one of those guys nobody guessed that he had any money. Uh huh. Yep. Just short of $2 million. Uh huh. And we're using this Hallelujah. tool to encourage others to begin thinking along that line. You, good. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you for that testimony. Let, you, don't have to, you don't have to just pick the ones that, you know, they're living oh, on the hill. No, no, no. It, I mean, it's something that you should be communicating church-wide because you, you never know. I mean, we had a, over in East Arkansas, uh, a lady died and left a Baptist church, I think it was in Mark Tree, Arkansas, and left her little country Baptist church over a million dollars, and she was a school librarian. And nobody had a clue. Uh, but... You can sort of wait around for it to be an accident, or you can actively market and communicate. Because what happens, people go into their attorneys, and they sit with them, and they're doing wills, and the attorneys say, is there anybody you want to put down to receive, you know, any kind of charitable gift? And what happens too often is that they'll sit there, and she'll look at him, and he'll look at her, and, well, well, you know, the, I mean, we did get that letter from the college about doing that. And they, yeah, yeah, go ahead and put the college in there. And... Why didn't they do the church? Because it never came to mind. And that's a real mistake that, that we make. The, uh, uh, the one thing I will say to you about planned giving, though, and, and using this example in, in, in College Station, because, see, College Station, y'all have got a, isn't there a little junior college or something there? Yeah, I thought it was. <laughs> I thought it was. There's another one just south of Brian, but, you know, <laughs> But uh, you want to be prepared for the gift before you get it. Now, and I don't know about First Baptist at College Station, and maybe they, they had this, maybe they didn't, and maybe it worked out. But a lot of times, we have been called in to work with tragedies around planned gifts because someone died, left $2 million, and the church split about 12 different ways on how that $2 million ought to be used. You want, before you ever get a gift, to establish an endowment policy that states gifts received will be used this way. Manage this way, use this way. What you want to make sure that policy says is that these gifts will never be used to replace the ongoing regular stewardship of the church. Amen. Or your people will just have spiritual stewardship death. Why, well, shoot, I don't need to tithe this year. You know, let Aunt Bessie's money pay for it. And, you know, that's, that's a spiritual dying. So when your policy is there, it keeps people from fussing over it. It's already set in stone. It's already been voted. It is. This is the way it happens. And you can get those. You can go on our website. We can get you an easy fill-in-the-blank policy. They're, I mean, they're easy to, they're not hard to do, but you want to get that in advance and get that in place. One of the things but, you refer to in some of your books um, okay. is the difference between the church and, say, a university. If, if someone does die and they give a $500,000 gift, the university continually has in mind additional things that they want to do yes. and places that, you know, buildings yes. they want to build, ways they want to expand, and in the church, we, we, we don't do We that. often don't. And, this, frankly, is, I'm, I'm thinking more of the capital gift here. Uh, how, how many of you, let, let's just see, how many of you in here have ever had a capital campaign? Okay, about a third of you. How many are in one right now? <coughs> Nobody present. How many of you think you may want to get into one? Three or four, okay. How many colleges in America today are in a capital campaign? All of them, right? All of them. Um, are you all in a public phase, by the way, in your college? We're in preparation. You're in preparation. Uh, so I don't think you're in a capital campaign. 
but you are. See, it hadn't gone public to his donors is what he's saying. Everybody doesn't know about it. But the trustees, the president, and others have had a dream, established a dream, and they're laying the groundwork for the fulfillment of the dream and beginning to communicate quietly about the dream. This is where our churches fail. We have donors every year in our churches who have capital assets. Daddy died, left me money. I sold my business, I now have money. There's various times, capital assets. I put in the market, got a big windfall. I have a capital asset available. I want to make a gift. I want to say thanks to God. Where's, what do I know is going on? Colleges are always in a capital campaign. You're not going to walk into the president of any college's office and say, Mr. President, I've got a million dollars. Where would you use it? That president will be able to tell you right away where they would love to use a million dollars in every college in America. But you can walk into most churches and the pastor would go, uh, 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 well, uh, gosh, I mean, we haven't even talked about it, but I can, I'll get the deacons together. Um, we'll, we'll sure discuss it. Um, you know, uh, uh, uh. You're not going to get that gift. What we always need to have, and this is kind of my, my pet rule with preachers, always know what you'd do with a million dollars if, you ha if somebody walked in today. Always have an answer. Always have an answer. This is your dream. No, we don't have a building plan sitting right here all sketched out. But this is my dream. This is the ministry I want to start. This is where I want to go. This is what I hope we can do in this community, et cetera. This is a need that we have someday. Always have a dream and a vision for what can be. And, and don't be afraid to communicate your dream that when someone has that capital asset, they will think of you and not just think of, of someplace else. When we're in a building campaign, we communicate those dreams. We want to build this education wing and we get the capital asset. Great, campaign is over, we have the money, we're building the building, and then we act like we don't need to dream again for another 10 or 12 years. And in that 10 to 12 year period, those gifts go elsewhere. Are you with me? You know, I say, you know, I was a pastor. I understand political process in the church. <laughs> you know, well, you know, we've got to get approval here, and then I've got to get the whole congregation to vote on it, and I've got to do da 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 Let me tell you, when you take a dream to the congregation to vote on, and you already have it paid for, you'd be surprised how quickly you can get a yes. <laughs> well, you're talking so. about <clears throat> capital campaigns and other things. Mm -hmm. One of the questions that gets raised a lot is debt, and I know yes. you have some strong feelings about that. I do. Particularly how debt can be the cancer that kills the church. It, it really can. In fact, uh, Tom, debt is the only single entity that I know of that has the sole power to kill a church. Wow. And in 22 years that I've been doing Horizons, I have never seen any singular thing <clears throat> that had the power to kill a church like debt does. Um, I, I've seen some bad pastors. Woo! I mean, they couldn't preach themselves out of a bag. Their leadership was awful. They, just, they were just horrible. But churches have ways of getting rid of them and going on. You know, I've seen some mean as snake lady. Just some awful people in the pews. Terrible. I was a pastor long enough to done some of their funerals, thank the Lord. Amen. <laughs> amen. <laughs> it's amazing what you can get an amen hey, to these days. It's true. It is. It's true. <laughs> but, you know, and the church can recover and go on. But when you make one bad decision about debt on one night, in a church meeting, there is a chance you can never recover. And it can kill you. It can kill you. I have seen churches with all sorts of thoughts that if we just build it and they will come. And they have built it and they have not come. I've seen churches 
build and say, you know, we'll just, we'll just pay the interest for the first couple of years and then we're going to have so many more people and we'll start on the principal. They never get to doing that principal part. Uh, I've seen churches believe that the good times that are rolling right now are going to be the same good times five, six years down the road. And I've seen a lot of stuff happen. You know, the, seen that bumper sticker, stuff happens. Happens in church. You know, I've, I've seen pastors run off with the organist. <laughs> I've seen pastors die. I've seen churches split. I've seen all sorts of stuff that nobody five years back thought would happen. You can recover from that kind of stuff unless you're sitting there with an unmanageable debt that the bank says, I don't care what's happened to you, you still owe this. And I've seen good churches close because it got unmanageable, and what was unmanageable was the debt. Go into debt. Debt, I, I'm not one of those, I'm not a Dave Ramseyite that says never go into debt. But go into debt with fear and trembling. Make sure it is a tool for your ministry, and that you do not invest yourself in it to the extent that potentially it can become your reason to exist. It is very hard to do evangelism up and down the street pleading with people to please come join the church and help you pay the mortgage. They just aren't that interested. And everybody in your church is a volunteer. <laughs> and they can choose to pick up and walk anytime they want when that's what you have become, just a place that is paying the mortgage. And it can so easily happen. Um, you know, when you look at a church that's paying 50% of its money to, to salary. It is very easy for this church to make a decision to enter into a debt situation to where they're paying 30 percent for debt. Then you put on what they pay to uh, the association, be a part of, of uh, Union Baptist Association. This 80 percent now becomes 85. Now you've got 15% of your budget left available to you to pay for every ministry, every program, to pay the light bill, to buy the insurance, to do the maintenance, and you cannot do it. It can't be done. And so you have a meeting and you say, we need to alter our budget. We got to cut something. So what do you cut? We'll cut the association. Just, just, just wipe that out. What else do you cut? Salaries. You cut salaries. Get rid of people. But see, I don't want to cut people, and I don't want to cut the association. I want to cut that debt. So how do I choose to cut that in half? See, I can't. That's the one thing that you're stuck with. And that's, that's what happens to churches. What they do, they have capital campaigns, and they say, oh, shoot, we can make these payments for the next three years. We're good. And you are, but in year four, it hits you. And now you can't, and your budget can't absorb a 30% hit. And there you go. So debt is to be looked at with great fear and trembling. Let me, let me offer you this, and I'm happy to do it, and we can work through Tom or whatever you want. Any of you that are thinking about doing a capital campaign, thinking about we may need to go into some kind of debt, can we absorb this? If you'll contact us, we'll do a cash flow analysis for you free of charge. And it'll show you here's where you're going to be left five, six years from now and what debt you would have and the percent of your projected budget that we give you that, that you can make an educated decision on. We'll be glad to do that. And we won't charge you anything for that. Happy to do that. Thanks. I appreciate sure. that. Well, time's running out. Let me okay. move to just a couple of other things. Uh, okay. One of the things you said earlier is don't treat everybody alike. Yes. And ah. uh, that also comes to the whole idea of how we approach folks in giving. Uh, most nonprofits target market. Okay? They know who their market is. At my college... Where I went, my father also attended that college, and so did my son. 
And when we get mail from the development office, it's three different letters. They send my 80-year-old dad a certain communique. They send me another and my 35-year-old son another. Why would the college do something like that? Because they know that we're at three very different places in our life and we think about giving to the college in three different ways and they'd like to get money from all of us. So they target their communications. What we tend to do in the church is the same letter to everybody. We need to communicate about finances. So to the lady who has been a faithful tither for 30 years, we send her a note that says the same thing as to the couple who joined two years ago and is yet to give a dime. And we send them the same letter. And they're in two incredibly different places in their spiritual journey. But we tend to say, here, secretary, send this to everybody. And that's a mistake. Learn who your members are and, and look at your communiques and understand that, that they, they respond differently. To your tithers, that letter better have a whole bunch of thank you for all that you've done. <laughs> to the person who's not yet given, suggesting to them that they increase their giving, Okay, I'll double it. What's two times zero? You know? So you want to send them a letter and say, we'd really love for you to join the, the givers of our church. We'd like for you to really pray and think about doing $5 a week. You got a chance. They might do $5 a week. And you get them started. And then you can thank them for starting at five and you can begin to grow them to be a tither. But, but you, you don't want to send the tither that same letter. So you've got to know who your people are in target market. Well, one That's of the it. things we talked about in our Generations Conference was the difference in generational That's giving, right. and you refer to that as well. Yes. You want to flesh this out for us a little bit? Well, you know, and it, it certainly is true, and you can see the, uh, you know, the difference that, uh, you know, the boomer generation gives about 15% less, and that 15%, the statisticians tell us, is what they're giving less to religion. <laughs> Uh, and, and that has to do some with communications. The builder generation, that's my daddy. That's the World War II folks. Look, my daddy clicked his heels and saluted Mr. Roosevelt and marched off to Europe because he said, that's what you got to go do. That's just the way they work. You know, you, you, president said it, you do it. The church says it. My daddy's preacher can call him up right now and say, we need, a, we need $100. And daddy will write a $100 check because the preacher said he needs it. And that's what you do. My son doesn't click his heels the same way to the president. My daddy doesn't salute the preacher the same way. My son is saying, why? What's that going to be used for? Now, we should have those answers, but you need to understand if you send my son the obligation letter you send my daddy, it won't work. So you communicate to your generations differently. All right, so, and, and this is a there picture of a very good looking oh, four it, generations. Well, pretty much. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, no, there are four generations. No, I'm talking about the good looking. Oh, I, yeah. I was afraid of that. <laughs> but they really do respond differently. Very much. Very, the older generation, very focused on the institution. Yes. Uh, the younger generation is very focused on causes. The cause. That's it. You know, and, and checks versus online, and, you know, my daddy will write, he writes a check. He gave me a check the other day. I sat there with him in the nursing home, and daddy got his checkbook out, signed it, and wrote $5,000. Had me fill it in, wants to take it to the church. You know, I'm thinking, daddy, we can just do it on the laptop. But you know, my daddy's understanding of a laptop, as he told me the other day, he wanted to get a computer. <laughs> and I said to him, I said, well, daddy, I mean, we can get you a computer, but then I've got to get you hooked up to the Internet and get you you know, DSL or whatever run line in here and all that stuff. And he's, he said, no, no, son. He said, I don't, I do, I don't want to do the Internet. I just want to Google. <laughs> <laughs> so we're in a little different place. What kind of ethnicity differences? Ethnicity? There are ethnicity differences, but frankly, my experience has been that it has to do more with how you were raised necessarily than the fact that you were born in this country, you had this color skin. 
that if, if, you were, if you were raised in a middle class household in the suburbs, you're, you're going to tend to think about giving in the same way. That's what it has, has more to do with. Uh, there is uh, some sense within, within ethnic groups uh, more of a tendency uh, to believe that they, they should still be given unto rather than they should give. And it is difficult to communicate. Uh, you'll work with them and, and they'll have the sense of, well, we don't all have to come up with this money ourselves because there'll be folks who will give it to us from the outside. Uh, in, in, in majority cultures, there's hardly ever a sense of, we'll sit around and somebody from the outside will give it to us. It's a sense, if we can't do it ourselves, it won't happen. Let me run through several okay, things go. pretty quickly. Uh, we talked we very can, briefly. And I'll answer quickly. Yeah, so, we okay. talked briefly about technology. One yes. of the things you say is we need to make it convenient to give. Uh, you know, as you've heard earlier and as you know, I mean, checks are, are going away. Uh, you know, I, I would ask, Thomas asked the question, how many of you had more than $50? I would ask, who, who of you in the past week uh, bought gas in some other way other than using a credit card? Anybody? One? Two? Two? Three of you. Three of you. Paid cash. Good for you. How many of you, if you pulled into a service station and it says when you got to the pump, we only take cash, not cards, would stay there and get your gas? Would you just drive on someplace else? The same three. Okay. <laughs> We have become we have a culture. We have to talk to the generations that, differently. That's, yes, yeah. I understand. I said the old man in the group. No, but we become. I mean, I drive away. Uh, the, the we have become accustomed to that's how you buy gas. What you need to understand is we've got a couple of generations behind us now who think that's how you give to anything is with a credit card. It's the only way I know how to do it. Writing checks is very foreign to them, and and so they don't do it. And yet, in most of our churches, that's the only thing we have. Don't get rid of it because my daddy is only going to give to you that way, but my son will not. So if you want money from both of us, you need to start looking at all the various ways that that they can give to you with kiosk with the uh, you know cards. just the, yeah the, the the swipe card just right there on the on a cell phone uh, to all sorts of credit ways certainly online going to you know and, and using a credit card to, to give that way I would look at every creative way that you can have because you want it to be within someone's comfort zone you want it to be comfortable for them to do it just a crazy question I I do cash you know because you know good staying out of debt. That's right. But what about young couples who cannot manage their debt and are using credit cards? What's your take on the church having that and they're swapping okay. the credit card and it's putting them further in debt? You can program all of that to only take a debit card. Okay. What would set up? Just a debit card? Okay. So, you know, if you have that concern and it's an appropriate concern, you can only take a debit card. I think one of the things that we typically do, we send out offering envelopes and we pass the offering plate. And, you know, if I'm giving electronically, then the offering envelope means nothing to That's me. Right. Passing the offering plate, then I feel guilty because I'm not putting right. something in. And so we've got to figure out also ways to well, encourage people to do it, celebrate. Well, the way that a lot of work. churches do that, if they have kiosks, the kiosk machine, if you've paid that way, will give you uh, a, a receipt out of it and you, you can drop this into the plate. Also, there I would make up cards that I would have in the pews that you can take this card and the card just says, I have given to the church, you know, uh, electronically or I give by, like, you know, uh, electronic fund transfer. It's just taken out of my, you know, and you can sign it and you can drop it in the plate. So you, ha you have a physical presence. You have a witness of doing this. Uh, uh, that I think is healthy, and we should provide those means for folks to do it. But uh, we're we're way 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 behind, way behind in in this. And again, it's just a, do you do you want it? Do you want money from everybody? If you don't, then you can just ask for it in a way that's within one particular comfort zone. But if you'd like to have money from everybody, you'd better get it within the comfort zone of everybody. What are the best kiosk options? That uh, securegive.com. Uh, 
is where I'd look. Now, to David's question, the okay. person who already has run up a lot of credit card debt and now they want to give using credit cards, one of the things you talk about is we want to encourage members to get ongoing training in absolutely and how to use their money yes so talk a little bit about that uh, if you're not actively using uh, uh, Financial Peace University Dave Ramsey or freed up which is Willow Creek's uh, option uh, used to be the uh, uh, well yeah good sense yeah uh, it's now freed up uh, then you should be on a regular basis one of the good things, frankly, that happened in the recession that some churches took advantage of and some didn't, but our people became more spiritually conscious of what money is doing in their lives than they ever had been when they lost it. <laughs> some of them realized, gee, I had built my house on the sand. This, this, you know, I thought money was going to be the answer. And Wow, that didn't work out so good. And this opened the door for many of our churches to have options of saying, let me tell you another way in another place. Uh, and they've been much more open to these classes uh, than they ever have been. I, I love to look at these as, as evangelism opportunities, frankly, in the community. Uh, if I was doing any kind of class like that, I'd get a huge banner out on the street. I'd, I'd maybe put door hangers out, et cetera. Please come to our class and, you know, we have got a whole generation that doesn't know how to manage their money and their debt. Now, they, they're not going to respond to please come to the revival at the Baptist church, but, but come to a Dave Ramsey. They see Dave Ramsey billboards. They hear them on the radio. Okay, they, they feel a little safer, but they walk into the church. Maybe they meet a few other people. They learn how to manage their money. They feel grateful to the church for providing them the opportunity. They met folks and Lord knows they're, they're out in your pew, you know, after that. But we should be doing that not just occasionally, but it should be a part of, of every church's annual education program. There's a whole lot more we could there talk is. about. There really is. Uh, out of time. We've run out of time. Uh, you have written several books. I've got uh, four of them up here. Uh, you want to give us just a quick rundown of what each of these books uh, covers? And okay. uh, then I want to ask you, which one's your favorite and why? <laughs> uh, well, in, in kind of order, Not Your Parents Offering Plate is... Uh, uh, is, is, is been the best-selling stewardship book that Abington Press has ever published. It's been a, it was a bestseller, and it's really the one that planted a lot of the seeds of some of the change that I'm talking about today. If you were just going to read one book, you wanted to just get one book for your church to deal with and study, that's the place to start. Whose Offering Plate Is It? is a sequel to Not Your Parents. It's meant to be read after it. It basically answers, okay, if we should do this, then how do we do it? So we make a case you should do things this way, and then here's how to actually get it done in the life of the church is what the second book does. Rich Church, Poor Church uh, is my observations of, of working in about 1,500 churches, uh, raising a little over a billion dollars for the church in that time frame, of what churches look like that I call the rich church. The rich church is, is a church that can focus all of its attention on mission and ministry every day. The poor church is a church that focuses its attention on trying to get enough money to stay alive every day. That's my definition of the two different ones. And they both have some very set characteristics that I've come to observe and see, and I wrote about that in Rich Church, Poor Church. It certainly stands alone. Uh, questions at the end of each chapter for church leadership to, to review and, and study. In fact, if we begged, you probably would come back and do something just on rich church, poor church. I'd be oh, well, on, on, any, on any, any of them, but yeah. I'd be happy to. Yeah. You wouldn't have to beg too hard. I'd, I'd be happy to come. This has been a pretty nice group so far. <laughs> church Money Manual, which just came out uh, uh, this year, just a, just a few months ago, uh, is frankly a, a collection of several years of blogs on here's uh, a question, pastor is called, wanting to know what do I do with this, what do I do with that. There's about 50 different topics of things that come up in the life of the church 
and how I would suggest they be handled financially. Very quick, short order, you can open it up. Here's what I do, two or three pages on that. So that's what, that's what church money manual is. So, so tell us just a asking. little bit about Horizon Stewardship and what you do and what you might be able to help some of our churches with. Well, Horizon Stewardship, number one, the mission of Horizon Stewardship is to make disciples of Jesus Christ. That's our mission. Uh, money is not what we're about. Ministry is what we're about. We have particular skills in money that we try to apply and help the church. But if money is all we get you, then we have failed. Uh, every strategist that works for us is dedicated to helping the church make disciples uh, for Christ. Um, we have been for the whole 22 years we've, we've been in business. Uh, that's some of the people that work for us uh, around the country. We work with churches in, in doing all things stewardship. We, uh, uh, we don't like to just focus. Uh, most of the time churches will call us, we've got to do a capital campaign. That's a big, difficult effort to do, and folks will call us and say, would you help us do that? And, and we have strategists in this room who do it. Uh, but when we do that, we ask to get intimately involved in all the other areas too. Your annual stewardship, your plan giving stewardship, we want to look at stewardship as a whole, not just one pocket, an entity. And, and we try to you know, bring, that, bring that to the table. Uh, we do just stewardship research. Church is a call and <laughs> just start out and say, we're broke. We're going to have help. Come do a campaign. <laughs> Why are you broke? I don't know, but boy, we are. Well. We don't want to just run to a campaign. That's maybe the wrong thing to do. But we have a thing called stewardship discovery. We go in and we look at everything related to financial stewardship, turn over every rock, give you a full report and analysis, an audit, if you will, on, on, uh, on where that stands. So th those are some of the things we do you know, around the country. We certainly do a lot of teaching events and that sort of thing. We have recently created, and I'll, I'll, I'll get off here, and this may be something, Tom, that your association or others would want to, want to take a look at. We have created the Academy of Faith and Money. Mm -hmm. We frankly were waiting for seminaries around the country to start teaching this stuff to folks who were coming out to be pastors. <laughs> and they weren't doing it. You know, we, we were, it was like we were educating doctors in laboratories, but we never let them work in a hospital. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and so we were having pastors who were absolutely making horrendous mistakes because nobody ever taught them how to actually run the church when it came to money and, and, and what to do. So we've created a four-day course for pastors called the Academy of Faith and Money where we're, we're, we're going to teach uh, about 12 different courses of all things related to really help you know how to go back into your church and be the leader you want to be in an understanding. In, we, in essence, we say this is everything you should have learned in school and didn't. And we try to teach it. That's the latest thing we've done, and, um, and we're excited about that. We're coming down. We're actually going to be in Houston doing the Academy in, in November. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, Texas Methodist Foundation is putting it on here in Houston uh, and coming here. But it, uh, when we initially did it, we had Baptists, Episcopalians, Presbyterians, Methodists, and Seventh-day Adventists in the opening course. And I think everybody thought it was just for their particular denominational group. You know, they had no idea that the Seventh-day Adventists had the same problems the Baptists did when it came to some of this, but uh, they did. That's a little, that's a, that's a quick word.